We took it all. We brought them to our land. An endless night. Ember hot and icy cold. The rage of the earth. We made this curse. Carved it in the blood on our backs. We did not see. We could not, but she did. And in the end... What will I become? Senwa Saga. Hellblade 2. Play it now with Game Pass. You're listening to Away With Words, the show about language and how we use it. I'm Grant Barrett. And I'm Martha Barnett. Imagine you're the mother of a four-week-old baby. You've given your baby a name that you thought was wonderful. It's pretty and a little bit unusual. You called her Maeve. M-A-E-V-E. Yes, Maeve. But since then, the reaction from family and friends has been a little bit less than Tepid. enthusiastic. They love the baby, mm-hmm. but they can't get past the name. Right. And you explain again and again that it's Maeve, M-A-E-V-E, and it rhymes with wave. But uh, Grandma accidentally calls her Mav, and you're constantly <laughs> trying to explain yourself to the point where now you're in tears. You're actually crying about it, and you're wondering if you made a mistake and if maybe you should change the baby's name. Should you change it? Have you saddled this baby with a name that is just going to be a problem for the rest of the That's baby's life? That's right. Is the baby going to hate you even more wow. than she does? I know what you're talking about. We found this discussion on the site Ask Metafilter. Mm-hmm. And it's really interesting. A lot of discussion. We posted this to our Facebook page and Facebook group as well. And everybody came out. Some people said, yeah, that's a difficult name and you should Mm -hmm. consider something new. And other people said, I named my daughter that and Mm -hmm. she's wonderful. Right. And other people said, my Waterford Crystal has that name. (laughs) (laughs) Which I don't know if that's an endorsement or not, but okay. Something beautiful. But this woman is suffering from namers regret. Will she get over it, do you think? Will she get over it? I would say that most people said, oh, it's a beautiful name. Yeah. That was, I thought that consensus in all the places that this was discussed was that it was a good name, Mm -hmm. a a little unusual, Mm -hmm. but plenty of people have it. Mm -hmm. And it's actually rising in frequency. I I wonder how many parents have that experience where they're thinking, well, did I make a mistake? And (laughs) is it too late to change? Now, now I'm not a parent. I know when I took my dog to the veterinary behaviorist, she said, absolutely, you can change a dog's name anytime, that it it has to do with your tone of voice and everything. Ah. But, But for a kid, I don't know. And there's another question that came up in all of these discussions. The baby's four weeks old, and yeah. a lot of people were wondering if the mother was just kind of having those baby blues. Yeah. The first little while with a baby can uh-huh. be an emotional time yeah. where there's not enough sleep and there's mm-hmm. so much to do. Mm-hmm. And you're still sorting out your feelings and the hormones and all that stuff. And maybe she should just wait. There'd be no rush even if she wanted to change yeah, the Yeah, maybe that's why she's crying, right? Well, we pose this question to you. Have you named your child something and then regretted it? And what do you think that the mother of Maeve should do about her name? Let us know, 877-929-9673, or email us, words at waywardradio.org. Hi, you have a way with words. Hi, this is Beth. I'm calling from Springfield, New Hampshire. Hi, Beth. Welcome to the show. How can we help you? Well, um, I'm curious about a word that I grew up with in my family, but I've never heard anywhere else. And uh, the word is potch. Oh. Uh, P-O-T-C-H. P-O-T-C-H. Yeah. And it's used in my family to describe the actions of a toddler who's just getting into everything you know, crawling in the cupboards and mucking around in there mm-hmm. or pulling the, the contents of a drawer out faster than you can put them back. Mm-hmm. Yeah, um, yeah. But you can also be a potch. Oh, really? Mm. <laughs> I, was a, I was a pretty good potch. So they, they made me a T-shirt that said Super Potch. <laughs> Super Potch? <laughs> Wait, so if you're a yeah. potch, what are you if you're a potch? You potch a lot, right? <laughs> you're yeah. a potcher. That... <laughs> yeah, you're, it's sort of an endearing term for a little kid who's just getting into everything. Who gets just potch. Potch. It's, potch. It's somebody who gets potch. Well, but I think, I think Beth, you're using it as potching around or something like that, right? Or the little kid? Yes. Yes. Wow. Because mm-hmm. here's, here's what I was thinking when you first brought it up. There's a, a, a Yiddish word, potch, sometimes spelled putch, but P-O-T-C-H, sometimes P-U-T-C-H, that comes directly from German. It means to smack or to hit or to bump or to knock or something like that. But it's also got some, a couple kind of weaker tendrils of meaning that have something to do with make a mess. And this is what I'm thinking where this mm-hmm. comes from. So you've got a toddler running around knocking, hitting, and bumping things and making a mess. But usually the way it's used is like, I'm going to give you a potch 
scratch on your bum if you don't stop yeah, that. Yeah, on your tuchus. Yeah, on your tuchus, right? <laughs> so that's really interesting that you guys have your own little variation on that. I, I can't say for certain, but I would bet that they're related. Yeah, that's what I would think. That's really interesting. Yeah, to make a mess. And if that's German, I know we do have some German ancestry. Mm. Ah. You know what we're going to do? This is this requires the, the etymology siren go on, Martha, and the lights start flashing. <laughs> we, I need to ask everybody listening if you use the word potch in the way that Beth uses it, right? To refer to a person who just kind of, what is it, potters around and makes messes? Is makes that what messes. it is? Yeah. Okay. So it's yeah. so usually for a kid? Yeah. Can an adult totally. be a potch? I've never heard it used that way, <laughs> okay. but I don't see why not. So okay. you're not a super potch anymore is what you're telling us. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. Okay. <laughs> well, right. maybe. Well, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Beth, we're going to put the word out. We're going to find out what other people use, if they use the word potch to refer to a kid who's making a lot of messes. All right? And we right, will great. we will report back on the air in a future episode, okay? All right, great. Well, thank you so much. Yeah, really sure. Thanks for calling. It. Call again sometime, all thanks right? Thanks for calling, Beth. Okay, thank Bye-bye. you. Bye-bye. 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 Potching around. Yeah, I can just imagine. I was thinking of my son when he used to shove his pizza into his milk cup and just like shove it up and down <laughs> with a spoon for, you know, ages. He would just do this, potching, literally potching, and it was splashing everywhere. And then he would eat it. So gross. Oh, gosh. <laughs> That's a Chip pot- off the old block <laughs> is what we're talking oh, about Oh, yeah, here. milk-soaked pizza. That's my thing. <laughs> We want to hear from you. Do you use the word potch in that way? Give us a call, 877-929-9673, or send us your comments and email to words at waywardradio.org. Grant, you know what the buffalo said when his son went off to college? Oh, no. Is there a pun in the answer to this? I don't know. What did he say? Bye, son. <laughs> Bye, son. Bye, I'm out Bye. of here. I'll see you later. Oh, you're leaving. Okay. <laughs> 877-929-9673. Hello, you have a way with words. Hi, Martha. This is Emily Goldman. I'm calling from New York. Oh, New York, where? New York, New York. New York. Oh, New where York, in New York, New York, New York? Hi, Grant. What block? You have to nail it down for me. I'm oh, picture. I'm actually in Brooklyn. Brooklyn where? I'm in uh, downtown Brooklyn. Okay, sure, yeah. What can we help you with today, Emily? Okay, so my question was about the word scat, as in scat music. Mm-hmm. And um, it came about, I don't remember how it came about, but we were talking about why it might be called scat. And I said, well, I thought maybe it came from scatological, which in my mind was sort of scatological thinking of all over the place and jumping around. And my husband said, do you mean scatological, like about the study of poop? And I said, what are you talking about? And he said, well, that's the definition that I've always known. Mm -hmm. And we Googled it and came up with sort of both answers, but it wasn't really clear. And so I figured I would come to you guys. (laughs) Okay. Ah. Interesting. There's a bunch of different scat words that are etymologically unrelated. They just sound the same. So the <laughs> scatological and scatology and scat is an animal scat. That's what you call the feces that uh, wild mm-hmm. creatures leave behind. Those all come from one set of words having to do with uh, old Greek words meaning dung. Yep. Um, and made their way all the way through the Romance languages and Germanic languages and popped up in English, and here we have it. But the scat and scat music probably is just imitative, as they say in dictionaries, which means at the beginning of some of these early scat recordings that we can find, I think some of them go back to 1911, believe it or not, people start out with something that sounds like, scat do that scat, 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 something like that. <laughs> and so it sounds like scat at the beginning. Now, oh, that's funny. the joke has been made, and the connection has been made many, many times that perhaps that particularly people who didn't like jazz might suggest that scat has something to do, jazz scat might have something to do with poop scat, but there's no connection there as far as we know. It just There's no clear connection. And the earliest citations that we have immediately start suggesting that it comes from the sounds people make and not from anything else. Interesting. Yeah. So, but what about my definition of a thought process? Does oh. that exist anywhere? Am I making that up? Like scattered? Is yeah. that what you mean? Mm-hmm. Um, that's a third, a third like etymological path. Is that a yeah. real so, word or... Scatological meaning something other than related to, to poo? Yeah. 
No, not as far as I no? know. Unless it's unless it's like a long-standing kind of um, homonymic joke. I, don't, I just don't know it. Yeah, I wouldn't think so. But so sk- my mom knew it also. And then when I did my Google search, somebody asked that exact same question on Twitter. That scatter. So oh, really? So freak- meaning like scatterbrained? Yeah. So that's why are you so mm. scatological? Why don't you think straight? Something like that? Yeah, I've thought of it as. The thought connections were scatological. They didn't make sense. Oh, wow. interesting. I don't know that yeah. one. Okay. I will suggest that it could easily exist, even though I've never heard of it, but I haven't mm-hmm. heard of it. Yeah. I, I think that's a bad joke. Maybe. No, I think it's a pun. <laughs> well, it's a joke or a pun. <laughs> yeah. The other scat, as in from to like scat cat or to scatter, uh-huh. like probably scoop. are connected to the word shatter, yep. meaning to fall and break into mm-hmm. a bunch of pieces or to spread far and wide. Oh, interesting. So who who would have thought that there was so much to say about scat, <laughs> I right? I wouldn't have thought it at all. <laughs> Emily, though, uh, i got to say that I just dumped a ton of information on you. I hope some of that helped. Yeah. <laughs> okay, Absolutely. Great. I'll stop using the word. I wanna, <laughs> are, do you, now, yeah, I have probably. to ask you, are you a jazz scat singer? Because that, that still happens. No, I'm not. I could see you in a smoky bar somewhere downtown <laughs> Brooklyn. <laughs> Like one of these speakeasies yeah. downstairs yeah. in a brownstone with the unmarked door and the red light, mm-hmm. you know, the big burly voice. guy letting you in, yeah. right? Okay, that would be nice. Mind. I like yeah. I like hanging out there once in a while, but <laughs> I'm not as into jazz. I'm more of a blues gal. Oh, okay. <laughs> Emily, you're a delight. Call us again sometime, yeah. all right? I will. Thank you so much, guys. Take care now. Have Bye-bye. a great day. Bye-bye. Bye. Call us with your language questions, 877-929-9673, or send them an email to words at waywardradio.org. Brent, I have a word that I think you're really going to like. Oh, really? Sitzfleisch. You know German yes. sitting flesh. Is yes. this your rump? Yes, uh, specifically sit flesh is is the flesh. The back derriere. There. Right. But it um, it means metaphorically the ability to endure, perseverance, to, to sit there long enough oh, on the okay. chair. You know, sort of like chair glue, mm-hmm. that ability to, um, to, to persevere. Stick-to-itiveness. Yeah, yeah. German word, obviously. Yeah, in German you might say say the equivalent of little Fritz doesn't have much sits flesh. That the is ability his, to sit still. His aunt See. Okay, cool. Sitzfleisch. S I T Z F L E I S C H? Exactly. Okay, great. Sitzfleisch. What cool words have you found? Let us know. 877 929 9673. Email words at waywardradio.org. Hang in there. We'll be right back with more as the Way with Words continues. with Game Pass. You're listening to Away With Words, the show about language and how we use it. I'm Martha Barnett. And I'm Grant Barrett. And on the line is John Chinesky from the mean streets of New York City. Hello, John. I've been handing out mean quizzes as I walk down the street. People you have another one? <laughs> Here it comes. Yeah. Instead of stealing wallets, you put quizzes in people's pockets. <laughs> yeah, they, they love that. I, I think they love it. I know I would like it if someone put a quiz in my pocket. So here, let me ask you guys a question. Speaking of questions, here's a question. How is Betsy Ross... Like tight pants. 
<laughs> uh, something she busting has, a stitch? stitch. She has to be sewed into them. I don't know. <laughs> no, that's, Betsy Ross is like tight pants because one is a seamstress oh. and the other is seam stress. Ah, okay. seems to, so we're talking about oh, a difference in God. stress or emphasis on a syllable yes. here to make a different and, meaning. And spacing, too, like okay, if spacing. you space these nice. letters. Okay, oh, that's the theme okay. of our quiz. I'll give you two clues. Ooh. Both answers have the same letters, but different spacing or stress. Here's some more of these. Uh, how How is it like? Here we go. Okay. How is the newest member of a trade guild like a saintly person? So, so is it something like union, apprentice? One is apprentice and one is uh, no, apprentice journeyman. is closer. Um, uh-huh. The root of the word is novice. new. Novice. Yep. So oh. one has no vice and one is a novice. <laughs> there you go. Yes, very good. good. One, Grant. Oh. I like it when I can actually hear the gears <laughs> grinding. Working, working, grinding, yeah. How is a walk in the woods like saying, hello, your highness? One is high king and one is hiking. Yes, oh. very good. Hi, Kim. <laughs> How is a condiment like your pets in the morning? One is the cat's up, and the other one is ketchup. Oh, my God. <laughs> yes, very good. good one. We, have, we have found Grant's Bilwick, his <laughs> specialty, yes. We found my Achilles heel. That's okay. Bring oh, out the Greek get, and Latin roots. You'll and get we'll yours, quickly go I'm to sure. the bottom. <laughs> yeah. How is having a baby like a commissioned sculpture? It's a procreate and procreation. Procreate. Yeah, <laughs> I was a going procre- for- Yeah, procreation versus procreation. Yes, procreation <laughs> versus procreation. Very good. Nice. Good, right. Martha. Martha got that one. <laughs> good. How is an appetizer like an impersonator? Hmm. Name different kinds of appetizers, little, little know, hors d'oeuvres. Canapé and... Oh. Canapé and can... Oh, one can ape and the other one is oh. a canapé. <laughs> yes, oh. very good. See, I love the change oh, in pronunciation between whoa. the two words because yeah. that, yeah, that's the clever part, right? Yeah, yeah that, makes it, that makes it fun. How is approval like a released prisoner? Approval like a released prisoner. Ex-con? Yeah. Or a prisoner at the end of his, of his sentence. Condone and a condone. Oh, yes. nice. Okay. Very condone, good. Condone. Lord have mercy, these are All hard. right. How is barbecuing a steak like a life preserver? <laughs> Sometimes what? when I eat a steak, it does feel like my life has been saved. <laughs> yeah, that's good. <laughs> a sear. So sear the sides? No, sear. And then see something. See your, clue is, your clue is gerund. Oh. Searing. And sea ring versus searing. Yes, searing oh. and sea ring. Martha, Very you had good. it. You were like 95% there. Yeah. Sea ring. How is a piece of hallway furniture like an artificially goosed sitcom? Laugh track? Mm. Hat rack. I don't know. What? Oh. Hot well, track. Yeah. Hat yes. rack and ha track. Oh my hot God. Rack and hot That's track. Great, Good. Grant. You did very, very well at these. Thank you, John, very much. You're we'll very talk welcome. to you again next week. See you next week, guys. Bye bye. Bye, John. And if you want to talk about any aspect of language at all, please call us, 877 929 9673, or send your questions and stories about words to words at waywardradio.org. Hello, you have a way with words. Hi, this is Erin from Tallahassee, Florida. Hi, Erin. Hey, Erin. How you doing? I have a question about um, the word pound, as in, like, the animal shelter pound. Mm -hmm. Um, I have two dogs, and I adopted both of them from different shelters. And it occurred to me one day that, you know, some animal shelters are referred to as the pound. And it sounds, I don't know, meaner or less humane to me, Mm -hmm. but... Um, at the same time, you know, animal shelters can be kill shelters, so that's not exactly humane. So I was just wondering where mm-hmm. that term, the pound, came from. Interesting. Yeah, the term animal shelter itself uh, didn't take off until the 1970s or so. But, oh, okay. But, uh, yeah, I remember from my childhood talking about the pound, but you don't mm-hmm. hear that so much anymore. I only knew the pound from, like, cartoons. Oh, you know? really? Yeah, where the dog catcher was chasing the dogs oh, and there were hijinks as a result. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's yeah. what I always remember is the, like, the, I think it's, um, I don't know, some dog is, like, lost in the city in the pound. The dog catcher is mm. going to take mm-hmm. the pound. 
that's the vision I have when I hear the word. <laughs> Interesting. Yeah, the word pound goes way, way, way back to uh, to the late 1300s, I believe, just as a term for an enclosed space or enclosed area. And in fact, it's a linguistic relative of the, of the word pond, which is also s- sometimes formed when you dam up a, a river or something. So you make for, a round enclosure yeah, for the water. Yeah, yeah, like an artificial hmm. uh, enclosure like that. So pound was used for, for centuries. And originally it was mostly cattle, mm-hmm. right, to stop yeah. cattle from straying into your your garden or your, your wheat fields. Yeah, yeah, your herd animals that are wandering loose, um, they would be put in a pound. And later that was used for stray dogs and stray cats and that kind of thing. So it's, mm-hmm. it's a oh, very cool. old word. So uh, it has nothing to do with, like, the impound lot. For animals. <laughs> well, it, it does in that impound is a verb that was formed from the word pound. Mm-hmm. You know, oh, okay. Your car impounded. You're putting them in the pound. The I-M is yeah. actually the same etymological root as I-N. Yeah. So it literally means in the pound. Yeah. But it, it goes back to an old word meaning enclosure. Oh, Aaron, thank you so much for calling. Give us a ring some other thank time, you. too, okay? Okay. Thank you Bye-bye. for taking my call. Take okay. care. Bye-bye. Take care. Bye-bye. I have to ask you this. Yes. It's not related to compound, Correct. Right? Oh, yes. Now, this is strange, right? This is really strange and really interesting. The word compound goes all the way back to a Malay term. That Malay, got, like from Malay, Malaysia. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. They got picked up by the Dutch and the Portuguese back in the 1600s. Mm-hmm. And it sounds like the word compound. It's something like compound or something like yeah. that. And it found its way into English as compound because it makes sense. There's a little but, bit of overlap. Oh, a little bit of overlap semantically, yes. and we conformed the spelling to s- look a little like the English word, exactly. but, but they're not related to Malachi. Right. If you're talking about the Kennedy compound mm-hmm. up in New England, it derives from Malay. From, a, from an Asian language. That's yeah. really cool. Isn't that wild? English. You know, English. we should do a show about that. Gosh, let's do that, Grant. <laughs> let's see. 877-929-9673. Email words at waywardradio.org. Tweet at W-A-Y-W-O-R-D. Find us on Facebook and Twitter. If you want to listen to the show anytime, try us on iTunes, Stitcher, Swell, and I don't even know, all over the place. Lots of apps have the show for free. Grant, we were talking earlier about the woman who named her daughter Maeve and then was having second thoughts about it. Yeah. And we didn't talk about our own names. Ooh, nice. Um, I was not so happy with Martha once I found out that, you know, I looked up in a baby book when mm-hmm. I was a kid and saw that it meant ladylike. And I thought, <laughs> you know, because, because it's a reference to Martha and Mary, and Martha was the domestic one mm-hmm. in the Bible, but I didn't like my name after I read what it meant, ladylike, because, I mean, I was climbing trees and, you know, playing softball and stuff like that. Then I grew to like it. And it's you. Yeah, it's it's me. At the time, it was really old-fashioned. It was kind of a musty name. Mm, interesting. But I like it. What about Grant? Well, I looked it up when I was a kid. Supposedly, I read that it came from French words meaning great or grand. It's like oh, a variation really? on G-R-A-N-D, oh, which so could mean fits. it could mean fat, though, as, as oh. well as it could mean great, <laughs> oh, right? Oh, really? Yeah. Oh. And so it didn't really bother me very much. But what I think I need to say is the name confusion still happens today. People, even listeners, call me Graham. Oh, yeah. Or they call me Garrett. Mm-hmm. I get a, And I don't mind. It's happened mm-hmm. my entire life. Yeah. Even though Garrett is a far less common name than Grant. Oh, I'm not... Grant maybe, Barrett. Yeah, maybe in their lives they have a Garrett, and that's the first thing that springs to the keyboard. But people usually get my name right. What does that mean? You're a unique <laughs> specimen in the world, Martha. There's well, no I one else that. like you. There's only one of me. <laughs> Give us a call. Let's hear about those name confusions. We know you've got a story. 877-929-9673. Six seven three. Email us words at waywardradio.org, or why not start a conversation on Facebook? Hello, you have a way with words. Hey, young lady, how are you today? Well, I'm fine, sir. How are you, and who are you, and where are you? My name is Jay, and I'm from Florida, Florida. All right. Well, Jay, it's good to talk to you. How can we help? Well, as a little boy, you know, growing up in northern Florida in a little small community, but the community was small, but we had five junk joints. Just like the regular juke joints where people go to dance, and I always wonder why they call it a juke joint. You know, you know because juke joint. I looked it up in Webster, and it was a slang term, juke, mm-hmm. because there's no, even though it's a noun, because it's a place. But as time uh, went by, the actual word was jug, J, O O G, 
And as time went by, they took the G off and made it a K. So it would be easier to say. And so I did a little bit more looking into it. And come to find out that word Jug, J-O-O-G, is a West African name. It means to jump up or move around. When you put that together with Jug, that means, you know, go to a dance hall or whatever. And so that's how that word migrated into the American mainstream of a Jug joint or a Jug player or like that. Or you go Jugging, even they use it in the NFL, like you Jug somebody, like you move around to make him miss you. That's where that word came from. Jay, this is great stuff, and I can add to what you're telling us here. It's a it's a really interesting story because we're pretty sure that the juke comes from— I, I, it's interesting you say juke instead of juke. Um, mm-hmm. the, the word comes from one of three West African languages that have similar right. words in them. But this word appeared first among the Gullah people on the right. eastern seaboard in South Carolina and Georgia, all up and down there. And right. they opened up these gambling halls where you could get ladies uh, of the uh, evening and you could drink a rot gut and you could dance the night away and get in trouble. And and the the juke that you mentioned about jumping or moving quickly may be related to this, uh, but we're, it's probably more likely these West African words meaning uh, uh, something disreputable or um, disorderly uh, or about misbehavior. Although there's an interesting note um, coming from the Scots language. There's a word dating back to the 1700s, which sounds very much like this. It's J-O-O-K or J-E-U-K, and it means a, a small shelter where you might hide out from a, a storm. And so right. it's possible uh-huh. that all of these different meanings of juke came together and kind of reinforced each other and were applied to juke joint or juke joint. Yeah, I mean, that word now, uh, even though it doesn't have the K or the E-U part to it, you know, it's part of the um, American mainstream That's nowadays. Right. You know, mm-hmm. before, you know, it was pretty much you know, like when they would call on the on the uh, Chitlin Circuit or something like that, you know. But now, part of the, uh, the mainstream every day now these days, you know. Mm-hmm. That, that's sure. exactly right. It, it shows up uh, one of the earliest uses of the, the term juke joint. Um, actually, she just calls it a juke, J-O-O-K, is in Zora right. Neale Hurston's uh, work, Jonah's Gourd Vine. And so we have it from an authoritative source in the African, African-American community that it was already by the 1930s well known enough, although she feels it's not well known enough that she has to include it in a glossary and explain it to her readers, which I found to be very, <laughs> very interesting. Yeah. Jay, thank you for the call. Okay. We really appreciate it. And call us anytime you've got something else to bring up, all right? Okay. Thanks a lot. Thanks for taking my call, you guys. Take care now. All right, guys. Take care. Bye-bye. And we'd love to hear your stories about language. You can call us at 877-929-9673 or send them an email to words at waywardradio.org and find us on Facebook and Twitter. had a call recently about the term husband. Yes, this is uh, some an ex-husband. Yes, yes. We got some other suggestions for what you can call your ex. We heard from Yen Feng, who wrote us from Singapore, to suggest the word wife out, which I kind of like. <laughs> a husband can't be a wife out without an ex-wife. So wife out is one. And then I really loved this one from David Crisp in Billings, Montana. He said, my own favorite term came from a woman whose name I don't recall who referred to her ex as her penultimate husband. <laughs> Isn't that great? Her penul- For a second there, I thought you were saying that he couldn't remember his ex-wife's name. No. <laughs> <laughs> no, David says, my own wife had been married before she met me and some 35 years into our marriage. It still gives me considerable comfort to think of her ex as her penultimate husband. Uh, the last, that suggests that he's the last and final. Right, yeah. right. The penultimate <laughs> is the next to last. I really I like that penultimate husband. That's that sounds so nice, doesn't it? <laughs> yes, it does. It's nice for the ex, and it's nice for the present mm-hmm. husband. So. And uh, plus, fancy word. So yeah. points for that. Yeah, penultimate. We'll take your fancy words for an ex eight seven seven nine two nine nine six seven three, or email them to words at waywardradio.org. Hello, you have a way with words. Hi there. This is uh, Brad Davis calling from Dallas, Texas. Hello, Brad. Welcome to the show. Hey, what's up, buddy? Thank you. Hey, how are you? I'm excited to be here. We're we're great. How can we help you? Well, um, my grandfather, whom I never met, was known for his colorful expressions. And one of the ones that I had always heard growing up was scattered from hell to breakfast. So if uh, he might say, 
oh, I went into Joe's office and things were scattered from hell to breakfast. Um, he might also use it to describe somebody's mental state. That lady didn't know what she was talking about. She was scattered from hell to breakfast. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I, I love the saying, but I'm not quite really sure what it means. I mean, I get the, the context, but but I'd love to know the origins, if there are any. So, Grant, hell to breakfast, either helter-skelter or... Oh, yeah, or, or thoroughly, all, completely, all the way, yeah, completely, yeah. yeah, from hell to breakfast, like over a wide area, over a long distance, over a long period of time. Mm -hmm. So we're talking about a an emphatic kind of slangy <laughs> statement, and it's so colorful, and yet it kind of avoids the trap of using the word hell. If you're very careful about your language, for some reason, people kind of get away with using hell in that context, whereas they might not use hell as a an interjection when they're angry. Does that make sense? Sure. Some people have speculated it's related to Hell's Kitchen because there is a, a, a little used version of that, which is something like almost exactly the same way, which is like, I could not believe the mess the kids made of that room. They had toys scattered all the way to Hell's Kitchen, which means from here to Hell's Kitchen. And mm -hmm. so when we're talking about Hell to breakfast, we're talking about from Hell, a very deep, dark, far away, dangerous place, all the way to where I eat my breakfast in the morning. <laughs> so it's a, it's a long way. Yeah, I've also seen from Hell to Harlem. Hell to Harlem is another mm -hmm. one, yep. That's all interesting. You know, it's funny, and I do use, occasionally use the phrase myself, and uh, it always seems to uh, make some heads cock a little bit. So uh, uh, that's great to know a little bit more about it. I hope you keep using it. Well, Will, and, and some of the other phrases that he used are, are quite interesting. Maybe I'll... Uh, be able to call back and discuss those at a later date. Yeah, Please sure. Do. We'd love yeah. to have it. Yeah, or pop an email over and we'll take a look at it. That's wonderful, Brad. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. Okay, okay. bye bye. Take care. Bye bye. Bye. You know what? Looking here in the Historical Dictionary of American Slang, I see from Hell to Breakfast goes back to 1862. Oh, wow. Yeah, long history. Okay. And I love that it pops older. up during the middle of the Civil War, basically, right? Oh, of course, During this yeah. period of major American kind of sturm and drung, like all this yes. horrible kind of chaos that brought language from the South to the North and language from the North to the South. We'd love to hear about the words and phrases that have been passed down through your family. Give us a call at 877-929-9673 or send it an email to words at waywardradio.org. We talked on an earlier show about word unit palindromes. Those word are... unit palindromes. Right. So each individual word going one direction goes exactly the same. As opposed to letter palindromes. Yes. Yes. And I found a couple of others that I really liked and wanted to share with you. I think my favorite is... Escher drawing hands, drew hands drawing Escher. <laughs> right? You can picture Took me a that second. One. I was like, oh, oh, yeah. <laughs> D kind of a double eureka in that one. Nice. Yeah, and here's one about aphrodisiacs. Desire? Consuming produce can produce consuming desire. Yep, yep, yep. And so that true, works. too. Isn't it? <laughs> Pass the asparagus. 877 929 9673. You know, there's a word for what you're thinking about. Find out in just a minute. Stay with us. Hey, we've got something special for those of you who love our show but could do without the ads. That's right. Imagine away with words, the same engaging conversations, the same deep dives into language without advertising interruptions. We're talking about our ad-free podcast feed. It's sleek, clean, and it's just for our supporters. It's at waywardradio.org slash ad-free. It's inexpensive, easy to sign up for, and works with all major podcast apps like Apple Podcasts and Spotify. It's an affordable way to support the show and get a seamless listening experience. And if you're feeling generous, why not give a subscription to another Away With Words fan? That's waywardradio.org slash adfree. Sign up today. Your support means the world. waywardradio.org slash adfree. Thank you. You're listening to Away With Words, the show about language and how we use it. I'm Grant Barrett. And I'm Martha Barnett. 
I remember as a little girl getting lost for days in the books in the Little House on the Prairie series. You read those, Yes, I, I did. Mm-hmm. And I remember checking them out from the library, and the pages were already soft because so many people had checked it out, mm-hmm. so many other kids. And, and it, they were such big books, too. You remember that? There were I felt like it was an accomplishment pa- to right, read them all. Right. They were hundreds of pages. And they depicted life in the Midwestern United States in the late 19th century. And they were the memories of of the author Laura Ingalls Wilder. But what I didn't realize until recently, Grant, was that those books were actually the product of a close collaboration between Laura Ingalls Wilder and her daughter, Rose. Rose Wilder Lane, is it? I think so. Yeah. Her mom stayed in the Midwest, but Rose became this world traveler, and she lived in New York City for a while. And there's this whole correspondence between them where Rose was editing her mother's work. And a lot of the uh, comments I found sort of heavy-handed and and overbearing and kind of arrogant sometimes. She was known, Rose was known as a little bit of a bully, not just around her mother, but other people. Right. There was one bit of advice that I saw in a letter that she wrote her mom that I thought really made a lot of sense. She wrote, You must take into account the actual distinction between truth and fact. It is beyond all human power to tell all the facts. Your whole lifetime spent at nothing else would not tell all the facts of one morning of your life. Just any ordinary morning when you get up, dress, get breakfast, and wash the dishes. Facts are infinite in number. The truth is a meaning underlying them. You tell the truth by selecting which facts illustrate it. What a perfect advice for Isn't a beginning it? writer, right? Yeah. And I could see this because I've, I've read a number of manuscripts where people are writing their life story and they want me to look at it and... And for me to tell them what I think about their prospects is getting this published and making a sale or even some of them think that they're going to get a big movie deal and Mm -hmm. Spielberg will take it on. Mm -hmm. And they make the same mistake, apparently, that Laura Ingalls Wilder made. And Rose is right on target. You you can't say, and on that day I was wearing Mm -hmm. this dress and these shoes and I remember that the mail came. You can't Mm -hmm. list all that. Mm -hmm. You have to summarize and bring together the important points into the narrative. Yeah. Are you tempted to go back and read the Little House on the Prairie books just to see what you think of it now, knowing what you know about the relationship between Rose and Laura and putting these books together? You know, I did. I I mean, not the whole book, but I went back and read some of those, and they're better than I remember. Oh, wow. And in fact, they are books that I would recommend to somebody who's learning English as a second language. I mean, there's some very specific language to um, having to do with life on the prairie and all of that and and very quotidian descriptions, but, but I, f- I think it would be a really good book for somebody who's just starting out in English. Well, this is really interesting stuff. We'll share that letter that Rose wrote to her mother about putting the books together on our website at waywardradio.org. If you've got a comment or a question about the Little House on the Prairie books or the writing process in general, we would love to hear about it. 877-929-9673 or email words at waywardradio.org. Hello, you have a way with words. Yes, uh, good afternoon. Uh, This is Leo Gomez. Hi, Leo. From Pennsylvania. From Pennsylvania? Yes, sir. Okay. Okay. Well, welcome to the show. What can we help you with? Yes, thank you. My question is, when I start reading in, 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 in English, I got a cross when the uh, when the um, the some Bibles and some uh, theologians they mention the Holy Spirit, all right? Mm-hmm. And some ones they mention the Holy Ghost. Mm-hmm. So my question is: there is any difference? There is the same, or there's gotta be some kind of difference? Uh huh. Ah, Very interesting. So, Good so question. That is a question that I have asked myself for a long time, and stupidly, <laughs> I didn't look it up. So, is there a difference between the Holy Spirit and the Holy Ghost? And I got to tell you, Leo, I'm across the table here from a woman who grew up in a preacher's house, so she surely has the answer. <laughs> 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 well, Leo, let me ask you first. May we ask what your first language is? Oh, my first language? Oh, it's Hispanic. Mm-hmm. Uh, Castellano, Spanish. Oh, Castellano. Okay. Yes. Um, because you have different words for that same kind of thing in Spanish then, don't you? Well, actually, no, because we, we sell the, um, uh, the Holy Spirit. Right, the Spirit. Espiritu Santo. We don't use ghosts. Right, exactly, exactly. So what, yeah, that's what I mean. You use a different word for, for ghost, yes. right? Yes. Uh-huh. Like fantasma. Yeah, we use fa- fantasma. Mm-hmm. Yes. And I would say that, that there's a similar difference nowadays between ghost and spirit. It used to be that that ghost could be used for spirit and that kind of thing. But now we, we tend to think of ghost 
as the kind of thing you would find in a haunted house, the the spirit of, of somebody who once lived. Right, an apparition, something that you can see, right? Yes, um, except, yeah, okay. except exactly in the context you're talking about when you talk about the Holy Trinity and the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost. Exactly, yes. Yeah. But um, the word spirit today, I think, in English has a much more generic term. Mm. You can talk about having school spirit or right. a spirit of camaraderie. You wouldn't talk about having a school ghost or, so, or the ghost of camaraderie. So the Holy Ghost, back in the days that the King James Bible was put together, they weren't imagining that Jesus Christ, a pale, transparent version of him, was looking over your shoulder, right? They were thinking about kind of the the soul of Christ or right. like the essence of Christ, right? right? Ghost and spirit were more similar mm-hmm. back then, okay, in other words. Does that make sense, okay. Leo? Yeah, it, it does make sense. All right, well, <laughs> cheers. thank Th- you very much for coming to your show, Ann. <laughs> Take That's care, now. Thank you. Show. Congratulations. All right, ciao. Oh, thank you, Leo. It's a great question. We appreciate it. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye-bye. Yeah, the Spanish fantasma is, is like phantom in, uh, right. uh, in English. So, that, but, but we have these archaic words. Yeah. Sometimes they last only kind of ensconced in these phrases like Holy Ghost, and we, we sometimes mm-hmm. just don't break them out to say, oh, wait a second, that's yeah. not the Scooby-Doo ghost I was thinking of. Right, right. Or like you might say, give up the ghost. You know, he mm-hmm. died, he gave up the ghost, but it's a... Uh, oh, but that's the same ghost as Holy Ghost, right? Gave up his soul, his soul kind of floated away out of his corporeal form. Yeah, I suppose. It, it, I, there was a time when ghost and spirit, I think, were more similar mm-hmm. in meaning, that they were more interchangeable, and I think that's what's going on here. Right. Ghost has got a long pedigree anyway. Very and long. Back in, deep yeah. into the heart of the lost roots of German, right? Yeah, yeah. Geist, right, like like poltergeist, mm-hmm. zeitgeist, ah, yeah, good. that kind of thing. Give us a call with your language questions, 877-929-9673, or send them an email to words at waywardradio.org. Hi, you have a way with words. Hi, this is uh, Pam Courier. I'm calling from Jeffersonville, Vermont. Hi, Pam, Jeffersonville, and, okay. What's cooking? Yeah, up north. Um, well, what I'm calling about is... Um, um, I was listening to your program and was um, thinking about how the type of words people use change over time in, the, in a certain area. Mm-hmm. Because um, I moved to Vermont back in 1964, and I moved from the Washington, D.C. region. And uh, at that time, Vermont really hadn't had a lot of influx of out-of-state people. Um, and when I started going to school there, I really noticed a lot of terms that I didn't understand, and I didn't know where they came from. And I think the one that surprised me the most is... Um, in Washington, at my school, if you wanted to go to the bathroom, you went to the lavatory. But up here, they went to the basement. And I could never figure out why kids would get up and ask to go to the basement. There wasn't one in the building, but they really meant going to the bathroom. There wasn't one in the building. I mean, there was a bathroom in the building, but there was no basement. Right. There was no actual basement. And the bathroom was on the second floor. <laughs> People <laughs> would still ask to go to the basement. Whoa. <laughs> so did you spend your first year of school just not going to the bathroom? Well, it took me a while to figure it out. Yeah. <laughs> you know, there were, there were a number of things I did that, that definitely stood out, using different terms for things. Oh, really? Um, in, uh, in Washington, the nuns at my school were called mother. Up here, they were called sister. Oh, boy. And uh, we could go shopping downtown in Washington, but here, everyone went down street. Mm-hmm. Oh, mm-hmm. interesting. So it just took a while to kind of figure out <laughs> kind of how to ask for things and how to fit in. Yeah, you look like an outsider, curious. right? Absolutely. I even talked differently. They thought I was from England because I had that sort of East Coast accent. Oh, right. Mm-hmm. That's so interesting. Hello. So let's concentrate on the basement yes. thing here. The basement thing is super interesting. It's not just in Vermont. They do this in Massachusetts and a lot of other st- states in that part of the country. Actually, throughout the nor- Northeast and Vermont, New Hampshire, Maine, Massachusetts, maybe even a little further westward, Connecticut, parts of Connecticut. Not completely. And not everyone, but you will find plenty of people who report as far back as the 50s and the 40s saying they remember this from their schooling days. For some reason, it's strongly associated with schooling. And the best Mm. guess that we have here is that there's been some serious semantic shift going on where maybe the basement was originally the place for the bathroom. And because we tend to euphemize the place where we do Mm -hmm. our business, I mean, almost (laughs) all the major terms that we have for that room in American English are euphemisms, right? Mm-hmm. Almost a bathroom. You're not actually taking a bath. Restroom. Right. Are you right. are you resting right. in there? There are tons of these. <laughs> Lavatory is great. Really straightforward. There is a little bit of hand washing going on, so it kind of counts. But it doesn't describe mm-hmm. the whole act and everything that you're doing there. 
So the best that we can guess is there was a semantic shift happening here, and it became generalized to such a way that you could have a basement on the second floor. <laughs> there wasn't a basement. There was a place that you did your number one and number two. <laughs> Yeah, it seems to have gone out. I don't think any kids use that anymore. My kids never heard that in school, so I guess that's gone by now. Oh, has oh. it? I oh, that was a question I wanted to know. That's that yeah, kind I of think... a shame because I love seeing those little remnants of the past. I love the idea of going upstairs to the basement. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Pam, this term might have been so widespread that it pushed out the other more standard meaning of basement in that part of the country. There's a note in the Dictionary of American Regional English that. Basement, referring to the lower part of a house that is basically below ground level, is far less common in the Northeast. And it's possible that this bathroom use of basement meant that people didn't feel comfortable referring to an actual basement as oh, a basement. So, so instead, uh, instead, most of them call it the cellar or the down cellar. Cellar. Do you yeah. use down cellar or just cellar? Uh, just cellar. Cellar. But you've heard down cellar. cellar? Have you heard down cellar? No, actually, I haven't okay. heard that one. Hmm. Interesting. Fascinating. Um, so, a lot of ground other things, but I haven't heard that one. Whereas in the rest of the country, the cellar tends to be a room or building that is mostly underground, but isn't connected to the larger house. Not always. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, so you would have a, heard of that. The, the, the apple cellar or the potato cellar or the vegetable cellar, the oh. fruit cellar, the ice cellar tends oh, not to be attached to the main fruit building. Fruit cellar, yeah. The fruit cellar, yeah. The yeah, fruit yeah. cellar, fruit cellar fruit here cellar. would be the way they would, might use it here. Yeah, but it's not attached to the house, right? Um, might or might not be. Might or might not be. Well, this is yeah. really fascinating. Well, it sounds like you're no worse for the wear, but, but man, <laughs> no. that must have been confusing <laughs> at first. Because starting a new school is hard enough as it is. It is. Exactly, exactly. So, well, I really appreciate your help. I just thought it was an interesting kind of quirk. You, Super Your instincts are good. You are correct. Call us another time. You remember something that you had to learn, all right? Okay, thanks. Thanks, thanks Pam. Pam. Take care Bye-bye. now. Bye-bye. 877-929-9673. Grant, we were talking earlier in the show about names. Names. And giving names to kids and the problems that come up if mm-hmm. you give a particular name to a kid. Remember that call that we had about Todd and Scott? Oh, it wasn't just one call. It was one call that turned into multiple calls Millions and tons of, of emails yeah. and yeah. phone calls in yeah. return. It was such a strange thing. I can't remember if the guy who called us was named Scott or Todd. So the whole premise was this. A lot of people who are named Todd are sometimes mistakenly called Scott. And vice versa. Right. That is, they have the given name Scott, but people for some reason call them Todd. Right. And we threw this out there because we had a caller who said, does this happen to anyone else? And it turns out it happens to a lot of people. Oh, my gosh. A lot of Scots and a yep. lot of Todds sent us email and gave us voicemail. Yeah, and we never could figure out why that was, mm, yeah. except that they're short names, short masculine names, and they have that, that short O in the middle. That's so the even if I you give your kid a name that's perfectly normal, I would call those fairly common names, yeah. right? Yeah, There's still a chance that they'll be misunderstood. Yeah. I'll never forget when my son was born. And I called my father-in-law from the hospital moments after the event, and I told him the name that we'd picked out, which was Guthrie, mm-hmm. G-U-T-H-R-I-E. Mm-hmm. Great name. And he says, I can't wait to meet little Gunther. I'm like, no, <laughs> it's not Gunther. He's oh, like, no. oh, sorry, Jeffrey. I'm like, no, it's not Jeffrey either. It's Guthrie. And like, Woody, Woody Guthrie like that? <laughs> so, you know, you can't win. Uh-huh. But every kid's got a little bit of this problem, yeah. no matter how yeah. unusual the name. Like, ask a Mary how often she's called Marie, mm, right? Yeah. It happens. Yeah. We'd love to hear your name confusion stories, 877-929-9673, or email words at waywardradio.org. Hi there. You have a way with words. Hi. This is Tor Borkstrom from Vermont. Tor? Tor, T O R. Okay. Okay. Welcome. What's going on? Yeah, I listened to your show last week, and, uh, and I was really intrigued with. Uh, the vernacular from different areas of the country, you know, and mm-hmm. uh, I was born in New Jersey, and when I was 13 years old, my family moved to rural Northeast Kingdom, Vermont, and I, the first day, the next first day, my neighbor came by, and he said a phrase that to this day I have yet to understand, and it's, make no never mind to me, and I looked at him, and I was like, what's that mean? And Tor, make what was no he ne- talking about? You have to understand, we we were like 13-year-old kids, and I, I went from suburbia to a farm with 40 cows. And, uh, oh, my. And that was, and that was in the day when they had uh, rectangular hay bales, and they wanted to play in my barn. And I was like, why? And apparently they had built all these little tunnels 
you know, by stacking the bales of hay, uh, hay a certain way. Oh, sure, yeah. But, mm-hmm. So it's like, well, do you want to, like, ride bikes? It's like, that makes no never mind to me. You're saying that he didn't care. Uh, that's really what I think it means. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, one way or the other, you know, makes no never mind to me. Mm-hmm. But I just, just to put those words together, just really doesn't make much sense to me. It's sprinkled throughout the United States, maybe a little more southern than anywhere else. I'm kind of surprised really? to hear it in Vermont. Yeah, yeah, but, I'm very surprised. Um, but it, it's uh, never mind. Here is kind of behaving like a noun. So think about yeah. it as a hyphenated compound. Never hyphen mind like that. Yeah. And the best suggestion yeah. that I've yeah. seen about the po- probable origin of this it comes from a 1982 article by Jerry Cohen in the journal American Speech, and he wrote about his theory that the, perhaps this is a perhaps this is a a speaker's blending of some other similar phrases, like you might say. Um, I, I don't pay that no attention. I don't mind what he says. I don't care yeah. about that. That don't make me no difference. That doesn't make any difference yep. to me. All these different ways of expressing negation kind of combined where never mind starts to stand as its own little thing, like um, as a response that you might say to something like, um, do you want to uh, go through the maze with me? Do you want to go through the hay maze with me? Um Oh, I don't care. Do whatever you want. Uh, never mind me. Just do your own thing. So never mind starts to get its own identity as a noun rather than wow. uh, or sorry, as a noun rather than mind being a verb there. That's so interesting oh. to me. I mean, I heard it growing up in the South and when I think of that expression, my voice goes up an octave and I lose the R. It's like oh, really? that, that don't make no never mind to me. I mean and it's said no in never- Yeah. <laughs> It's said in is said in a way that's sort of making fun of oneself. Oh, really? Okay. That don't make no yeah, mind to me. It was interesting in this article by Jerry Cohen from 1982. He quizzed a bunch of students from around the country. Uh-huh. He was at a university campus, and some of them reported they use it in anger, but many of them reported humorous uses. But his was a small sample. I just know that we've heard this from a wide variety of people around the country, and it's popped up here and there in movies and books. And so some people have heard it who don't actually use it, so that mm-hmm. makes it seem maybe a little more current than it is. It is still in use, though. Wow. Well, great. Fantastic. Tor, it's good to speak with you. Yes. This was so exciting. All right. Thank you, sir. <laughs> Bye-bye. Right. Bye-bye. Take care. Bye-bye. Take care. Bye-bye. Call us with your language questions, 877-929-9673, or send your stories about your encounters with words to words at waywardradio.org. Things have come to a pretty pass. That's all for today's broadcast, but don't wait till next week to chat with us on Facebook and Twitter, and you can find us on iTunes or SoundCloud. Check out our website, too, at waywardradio.org, where you'll find a dictionary, a newsletter, mobile apps, and a discussion forum. And you can listen to hundreds of past episodes for free. You can leave us a message anytime at 877-929-9673. Share your family's stories about language or ask us to resolve language disputes at home, work, or in school. You can email us, too. That address is words at waywardradio.org. Our senior producer is Stephanie Levine. The show is directed and edited this week by Tim Felton. We have production help from James Ramsey. Away With Words is independently produced and distributed by Wayward, Inc., a nonprofit supported by listeners and organizations who believe in lifelong learning and better human communication. This show is coming to you from the Track Recording Center at Studio West in San Diego, California. Thanks for listening. I'm Martha Barnett. And I'm Grant Barrett. So long. Bye-bye. Tomato and I like tomato, potato, potato, tomato, tomato. Let's call the whole thing off. 